You know, one of the most controversial laws when it comes to concealed carry is revolving around stand your ground. And today I want to tell you everything you need to know about this law. I want to give you some good information and of course I'm going to try to cover as much as I can so you have a better understanding of this but a couple of things that you need to know right off the rip. First of all, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not giving you legal advice. I'm just telling you based on the research that I've done and personal opinions on how I feel about stand your ground. That may surprise some of you. Maybe it won't but you can let me know after the video. Second, Every state looks at stand your ground a little bit differently. And so while my intentions are to kind of peel back some of the layers so you have a better understanding of stand your ground, I may not cover every single state and exactly how those states define stand your ground. So it is still something you need to look up on your own in your specific state so you have the, the full understanding um, in your given state. And so. I'm going to try to give you as much information as I can here though and if you like the type of videos I do including topic videos like this, gun reviews and even rifle reviews, pistol reviews, comparisons, even some World War II gun reviews, make sure that you subscribe, hit your notifications and I'd love to have you guys join the SHOT team which you can join right here or over on Patreon. Let's go and get into it. Now, Stand Your Ground started in 2005 when Florida became the first state to adopt this into their laws. Now we have 38 states that have some form of Stand Your Ground, but one thing that you need to know is not all of these states look at them as part of their state statute. As a matter of fact, eight of these states actually kind of leave that to case law or common law um, used in jury trials. So you have to use your gun in self-defense. It is something that, you know, a judge could look at prior cases and compare that to yours. And of course, they're going to try to use similar cases. Um, and it is something that could be used as defense. But in the other states, in the 30 other states, it is a part of their state statute. So it's been voted on at multiple different levels and now it's a part of the state law. Now out of those 38 states, 11 states, including Florida, Alabama, South Carolina, South Dakota, and a few others, actually have stand your ground terminology in the state statute. Now, stand your ground laws basically say that you have no duty to retreat when you are somewhere you have the right to be and you're not obviously involved in any kind of illegal activity. So if you go in and I don't know, you rob the local 7-Eleven and somebody pulls a gun on you and then you use your gun and you say, hey, stand your ground. No, that does not work. And another part of this is you have to reasonably believe that your life is in imminent danger. So anytime you hear anti-gun people saying that, oh, this is just, you know, the wild, wild west and it's a shoot first, ask questions later type of law, uh, doesn't make a lot of sense because you're not going to have a leg to stand on if it comes out that you were an initial aggressor or you didn't have the right to be somewhere or if you were involved in illegal activities, or the person that you used your gun in self-defense on actually didn't turn out to be self-defense at all. You know, it's unreasonable to think that, I don't know, an 80-year-old grandmother coming up to you um, and saying that she's gonna take you out, uh, unless granny's holding the gat, I don't see where that would hold any weight whatsoever if you decide to put her into an early retirement, if you know what I'm saying. You know, if she simply comes up to you and says some threatening words and you can just kind of walk away, um, that's going to be the best resort. This is literally saying that somebody has come up to you and you have a, a reason to believe that they can hurt you. Maybe you see a weapon. Maybe they pull a gun. Maybe they approach you in a threatening manner. You know, if somebody that's six foot five, I mean, I'm five seven, somebody's six foot five, you know, 300 pounds is coming at me and, and they look like they're standing on business, well, that's where I'm gonna have to stand on my business and do what needs to be done. And that's what stand your ground law is. You know, in other states, 11 of the states actually, 
they say that you have a duty to retreat if you can do so safely. Now, some of the states say that, well, unless you're, you know, actively being robbed or essayed or, you know, anything like that, then you could, you know, stand your ground. You know, these other states that don't have a stand your ground law expect you to run away. So, you know, if there's somebody threatening you and I don't know, they say, okay, you're, you're, 25 yards away, right? You're kind of right there on the cusp where maybe I could get away, but maybe they're holding a rifle and maybe they can easily, easily make that shot. Maybe I just get shot in the back then. Maybe they are 25 or 50 yards away, but you see somebody threatening uh, a, a family or, you know, an elderly person, or I don't know, you're in a grocery store and you see something like this happening. Well, you're far enough away where you're not really in any danger. Can you not intervene at that point? That To me, that says that you have to run away and call the police while somebody else is getting hurt. Where in stand your ground states and, and a lot of these states, you can protect others as if they're your own family, as if they're your own kin. Now, of course, it's playing a lot of what ifs. But to me, it makes the most sense that says that, hey, look, if somebody is trying to attack me, my family, or somebody else around me, and I have a way to protect myself, I have no duty to run away if they are looking to do harm to me, my family, or somebody else around me. To me, the most reasonable way to handle anything like this is if somebody is approaching me, whether with a gun, baseball bat, whatever, in a threatening manner or a family member or even somebody around me that I don't even know and it looks like they're going to do serious, serious harm or worse to that person or myself, I have no duty to try and run away and, you know, avoid shots or avoid whatever. I can stand my ground and I can protect myself. Stand your ground laws stem from the Castle Doctrine, which says that if you're in your home, somebody breaks into your home, you have reason to believe that they are trying to do harm to you, that you can protect your castle. Uh, and this goes all the way back to the 80s when they called these states, you know, make my day states, uh, in which lawmakers were looking to remove any kind of liability in a civil lawsuit if you had to use your gun in self-defense inside of your home. Now, stand your ground can be a defense at your job as well, but in two states, you actually have to own the business in order to use stand your ground law. So any of the peons below the owner, you can't use stand your ground. I know Wisconsin is one of those states where you have to be the owner in order to use that as a defense. This is a decision that everybody's gonna have to make for themselves. If you decide that you're gonna carry a gun, you have to you know, be willing to take those consequences, right? And I know over the past decade, uh, over a decade now, where I was carrying either in the corporate world or a local place that I worked at, you know, I always made that decision. I was like, hey, you know, I'm going to carry this gun on me and I'm going to accept those consequences. And it would have sucked, you know, to say, hey, man, you're fired. We know you have a gun in here, whatever. Somebody saw it or whatever. But at the same time, I was always willing to take that chance. And, you know, I kind of knew where I worked. I knew the people. So I was always under the assumption that, hey, if a disgruntled employee, for instance, walks in this place and is threatening to hurt somebody and I have to use my gun in self-defense, the owners and or managers will look at that and be like, hey, man, this guy potentially saved countless lives or whatever. Or maybe they didn't. Maybe they would say, hey, you know, thanks, but, uh, you know, you got to get the hell out of here. And that was a risk I was always willing to take. But I knew my gun was on me. I knew it was always within five feet. There were very few times where my gun wasn't, you know, within, uh, within reason. Because, you know, keeping a gun in your car is, is one thing. I, I would encourage that everybody, at least, you know, if you're going to, you know, be going to work, obviously you're, you're going to work, have your concealed carry in your car. Now, there are some states... Um, and there's some businesses, even in, you know, uh, any state, really, uh, the owner can prohibit you from keeping a gun in your car. But that would require them, you know, 
having to search your car and I, you know, I would never consent to anything like that. So, you know, if, if you're going somewhere where you're working, you're outside of your home, you're in your car, I would encourage everybody to do that. But you have to make that decision for yourself if, if it's worth it to you or not. But all I would say is, um, you know, sometimes there's consequences that come with that stuff. The whole idea, though, is we want to get home to our families. And I don't like the idea of somebody telling me that I can't do something. I know there's going to be people, be people that pop in here and say, man, I make, you know, $200,000 a year. I'm not chancing it. Dude, okay, that's, that's totally fine. You know, and chances are maybe nothing happens. But I would hate to be in a position where I, I needed my gun and I didn't have it. And, uh, you know, that's just not something, that's not a chance that I ever want to take. And so one, I think an awesome piece of advice is if you are more sketched out, if you're in like, I don't know, you work for like a super gun restrictive company, right? You know that if they were to ever see it or talk about it or anything like that, that they would fire you. Don't talk about it. Don't tell anybody. Make it seem like you're totally anti-gun, I guess. Um, well, eh, that may be going a little extreme because I couldn't, I don't know if I could even bear that, but just don't even talk about it. Don't say anything, you know, and then you should be good to go. It was a little bit different where I worked. People knew what I did, you know, reviewing guns and stuff. They knew what my videos were about. They knew I talked about carrying guns. Um, so pretty much everybody there, you know, knew that. Um, and uh, I guess all it would have really taken is somebody that didn't like me to say, hey, Heg's carrying a gun. And, you know, there's a chance that I could have uh, gotten fired over that. And um, that was always a chance that I was willing to take. Now, another thing that you want to consider is any kind of lawsuits. Now, I did mention how some states have it in their state legislature, while others actually um, say that you can use that as a defense in a in a jury trial, but um, I believe 16 states actually have it where they have shifted the burden of proof away from the defendant to the prosecution. So instead of having to prove you were in fear of your life, it's a presumption that you were in fear of your life. And again, shifting that back to the prosecution. So as you can see, it, it really is highly dependent upon the state where you live in whether stand how how strong stand your ground law is going to be you know in those states where it's in the state stature where the terminology says you have the right to stand your ground and where the burden of proof is shifted to the prosecution and not the defendant or you um, you're really going to have a a potentially strong case but that is not the wild, wild west, right? That is always assuming that, again, you are somewhere you're allowed to be, you're not involved in illegal activities, and also that you're not the aggressor. Now, I read a really good article. Um, it was like a two-page article. If I remember, I'll make sure I, I leave a link to it because I definitely want to give them credit. But they were talking about aggressors. And so while you could be initially an aggressor and there's different levels of aggressors too you know they kind of talked about like you know hey you see somebody breaking into your car if you say hey i got a gun i'm gonna shoot you you know that could be seen as initial aggression um or if you say hey you need to get the hell out of here get out of my car you make it known that you're there um and then you have to use your gun because maybe they pulled one on you obviously you know that's that's a little bit not a not really a gray area because that's not seen as aggression. That's you letting it know, hey, you need to get the hell out of here. You're on my property. So there's different levels of aggression and then initial aggressor. But you never want to be that initial aggressor. Now there are circumstances where you were the initial aggressor. You made a verbal confirmation. Hey, I'm backing away. I don't want nothing to do with this. Apologies. You back off and then the other person becomes aggressive with you and they follow through with that. Well, now you've made it known. But if you don't make it known that, hey, I'm just I'm, I'm walking away. Sorry, whatever. Then you could still be the initial aggressor. And then your you know, right to you stand your ground is null and void.
So the simplest explanation, and there's really no simple explanation to be quite honest with you, is you know, try to avoid any confrontations. And this includes road rage. This is something that we will all experience at one point or another. You know, road rage is something that can escalate further than it needs to, right? And, um, you know, it's really easy to take road rage incidents personal. You know, when somebody cuts you off or somebody's, you know, riding your ass in traffic or, you know, any number of things like that, man. It's, it's really easy to start, you know, getting your, your blood boiled when people do that kind of stuff. You know, I watched a video from this guy. It was just like this random guy. You know, he was doing an interview with people and somebody cut in front of the interviewer. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the interviewer was like, man, that guy was rude. And this, this kid just like came out of nowhere with this amazing speech. And it was like, hey, you know, most people, you think they're doing things intentionally, but they have their own lives. They have their own thoughts. They have their own issues. And most of the time they're stuck in those things. So when they do something that you see as intentional, don't take it too personal because they have their own lives and their own things that they're worried about. Uh, that's really easier said than done, but it really is such a solid explanation. People are drowned in debt and you know, you know what they're dealing with as far as paying higher prices and inflation, I guess is a better way to say that. Um, and just taking care of their family. Sometimes they're, they're not thinking about you and your problems. They're thinking about their problems. So that's not an excuse for, you know, uh, being a dick and, you know, cutting people off and all that kind of stuff. But um, I guess it does put a different perspective and may make you think, okay, this person just cut me off. I'm pissed about it. But maybe they're rushing I don't know, home to get to their sick child. I don't know. You know, that's, it's so, it's so easy to say that now, but in the moment, it's really easy to get worked up over those things. So it's just kind of like I talked about before, just trying to keep those emotions in check, understanding that we are held to a higher standard and we can never, never be the initial aggressor in these things because it can cost you your freedom. And the last thing I want to talk about is even in those states where stand your ground is really strong, right? And it, it protects all of its citizens, no matter where you are. It's, it's a really solid part of the castle doctrine and an expansion of that. It doesn't mean it's always going to protect you from prosecution. So having concealed carry insurance... On top of that, I understand insurance companies, they run everything, um, and it's just one more bit of insurance, but it is really something that can help you. I mean, self-defense cases and hiring lawyers and stuff, if you have to do all of that, I mean, tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars, and so could be other lawsuits attached. So, uh, like I said, concealed carry insurance, there's a number of companies out there that I trust, and I know that there's some other ones that you know, that I've promoted, USCCA is the one I still have. I know a lot of y'all say that they are not good, they don't pay out and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I from everything I've seen, they actually do pay out. That's one of the, the biggest things is they have people for you right then and there if something ever happens. What you don't want is some kind of reimbursement plan, right? If you have, you know, you're facing, I don't know, $50,000 worth of upfront costs, and they say, okay, yeah, we'll reimburse you as long as you're proven to be not guilty. Now, that is one big part of some of these concealed carry insurance policies is, you know, if you're guilty, I, I don't see how people would expect that they would pay for that. Um, and, unless you were done wrongfully in the case and all that kind of stuff. And maybe that maybe that's a possibility in some of these other states. Maybe something I need to explore, actually, and do a little bit of research on is uh, in some of these states where stand your ground is not as strong, you know, where the burden of proof is on the defense. Um, and then, you know, people are kind of like, dude, you know, I have this concealed carry insurance and I was just found guilty, but I'm not, maybe. I don't know. So uh, there might be a little bit of a little bit of gray area there, again, depending upon the state. But I think that insurance as a whole, if you pick a good company that's going to be there for you, the moment something happens, those are the companies that I would go with and just do some research, man, as to which one you think is the best for you. 
I'm not tied to any one company any longer. Um, I'm just not. I think that there's a better option. I'd love to hear those, man. If you have experience with a really good company out there, you know, I'll uh, I'll explore that option. But from what I've seen, USCCA is always done well by people that have had to use their services who were in the right, of course. So I don't know, maybe something I need to explore here uh, over the next couple of months and just reevaluate where the USCCA is and see if there's anything that's changed there that would also change my opinion. And of course, I'd report back to y'all on that as well. I'd love to hear your opinion about stand your ground laws and anything that I talked about here or any other thoughts you have about the subject. If you like what I do here, consider subscribing, hit your notifications so you never miss a video from me. And again, I'd love to have you guys join the SHOT team here on YouTube or over on Patreon. Big thanks to you guys. See you in the next one. And as always, holding down.